that your screen is off now. So that's okay. And I will no also I, I, can share that. Uh, I will add spotlight so that the two of us are both spotlighted. I think we are ready to go. All right. So two of us are spotlighted and we can get started. Uh, we have a decent uh, quorum as well of attendees. So uh, welcome, uh, uh, Professor Krishan, uh, and uh, all attendees to the uh, the inaugural uh, webinar of uh, the IIT Alumni Center. It's a uh, it's a great uh, uh, matter of pride for us that the inaugural session uh, which brings together the best of uh, the IIT Alumni Center's ecosystem. Uh, is uh, happening uh, in a in a digital mode. Uh, hopefully, in the future, we will have physical digital mode as well. Uh, and uh, uh, it, there will be multiple topics. We are going to shoot for a session every week uh, at the same time, 6:30 uh, India time on uh, Saturdays. Uh, each session will be roughly an hour. Some might be an hour and a quarter. Some might be an hour and a half. Uh, we have got a very good uh, mix of potential topics. A few of us uh, have joined together in the webinars committee. Uh, this particular session uh, is uh, is part of our faculty researcher of the month session. I'll come to the session today's session itself in a minute. Uh, we have uh, uh, you know, multiple sessions which will feature uh, distinguished speakers from the industry, uh, from the startup ecosystem. Uh, we'll also have uh, uh, a wildcard topic called contemporary topic of the, the month. Uh, they will be, of course, the old favorites, uh, the music uh, session in collaboration with iTunes, uh, the book session in collaboration with Bibliothek. The Voices of Excellence will come perhaps once every quarter with an eminent personality at the national or international level. Quiz is going to be back online. Uh, pals will also have uh, a presence on the uh, on the session, and there will be a mixed bag session, what we call a popuri session. Uh, you'll get a feel for it actually next week, uh, when, where things like you know personal finance, fitness, many others uh, will also come in. We are also planning joint sessions with the IIT Madras Alumni Association, with the Alum Alumni Center Bangalore, and others. Uh, so it will hopefully bring uh, the uh, Alumni Center Chennai. Uh, you know, to the digital world and the situation permitting, these sessions will also be done in a physical world as well. Uh, the uh, sessions will be, even if physical, will be available uh, digitally, uh, where a maximum of a thousand participants can be accommodated. Today, I'm told that we have nearly 200 registrations, so it's a great start. Thank you all for joining in. Every session will be recorded and will be made available on our website as well for people who missed the session and would like to see it uh, later. Uh, and uh, a hearty welcome to all our members and attendees from our partner institutions and uh, 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 other special invitees for today's inaugural session as well. So I'd like to uh, uh, now welcome uh, Professor Krishan Balasubramanian, our uh, uh, first speaker for the webinar series. Uh, so uh, welcome, sir. Uh, and uh, it's our distinct uh, privilege to have someone as eminent of you. Uh, talking to us about the broad applications of sensors and detection equipment uh, in, uh, in, in a way that I'm sure uh, many of us uh, have, have not experienced so far. Uh, you are uh, you know, a, a very eminent uh, person, and I will do my best to introduce you. Uh, thank you for that, uh, that, uh, uh, that startup slide as well. But as people are, as people are reading through, uh, I'd just like to uh, highlight a few points uh, from uh, uh, you know, the, the, the many associations that I've had personally with you. Uh, Professor Krishnan is currently the chair and institute professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at IIT Madras. And he is the founder and head for the Center for Non-Destructive Evaluation, CNDE, at IIT Madras. Uh, also concurrently, the professor in charge of the Gopal Krishnan Deshpande Center for innovation and entrepreneurship at IIT Madras. Uh, he was uh, the uh, uh, the dean of IC and SR at IITM for six years between 2012 to 18, where he helped to grow the IIT Madras research funding by almost a factor of four and IP filings by a factor of six. Uh, he's also served as a founding professor in charge of the Office of International Relations at IIT Madras. And uh, you know, incidentally, 
uh, he's not just a distinguished uh, academic, but he's also co-founded several startups, uh, including Dhwani Research, Planis Technologies, Detect Technologies, Maximal Labs, Solinas Integrity, and so on. In fact, one or two of his startups will be featuring in our startup series uh, later on in the webinar uh, sequence. Uh, he's a PhD from Drexel uh, in the year 1989, a fellow of the National Academy of, Academy of Sciences and of the National Academy of Engineering. Uh, he's a fellow of the Academic NDT International. Uh, he's also won numerous awards. A few of them you see on this slide, but I'll just pick up the, uh, the prestigious Abdul Kalam National Technology Innovation Fellowship uh, and the IIT Madras Lifetime Achievement Award. Uh, and, and so on. So you know, we, we are extremely privileged, sir, to have you here as our inaugural speaker. And uh, without too much ado, I'll hand it over to you. So if you can share your uh, 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 initial thoughts uh, on, on some of this, uh, you, know, you, you and your group have uh, proved amply that it is possible to carry out world-class research in India and specifically at IIT Madras. Right. So uh, I'll just set a few background questions so, so, so that there is a larger context for this audience. Uh, but in your talk, I, 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 uh, I hope you'll be covering what does a Raja research ecosystem in India look like? Uh, what is our collective ability to go from a, a world-class academic idea to outcomes which can impact the industry, the startup ecosystem and the world at large at scale? Right? So there are many such initiatives that we'll probably discuss uh, later on in the talk. But if you can throw light on not just your pioneering work, but contextualize it for this audience, because we have alumni, we have uh, members of corporate entities, we have faculty, uh, we have several startups from the IT Madras Research Park and larger ecosystem as well. Uh, it'll be useful if we are able to get a feel for your success, how did it work, and how will we apply it so that this can become something big at the national level. So with that, let me hand it over to you, sir, and uh, we look forward to your talk. Thank you. Thank you, Anand. And uh, thank you to the Alumni Industry Interaction Center. I'm very privileged to be part of the first inaugural lecture. Uh, this is not something that I, you know, it is something that I hold very dear to my heart. Thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, before I get into my topic, uh, I think uh, your question uh, was very relevant uh, to today's ecosystem in India. You know, having served about, uh, I spent about 16 years in the U.S., came back from the U.S. in 2000 to India. Uh, India has changed a lot in the last 20 years. Uh, I don't have to reiterate that. Everybody has experienced that. So the question that happens is, uh, and the question that you are asking is, so uh, what is the motivation? What is the uh, ecosystem? And what are the possibilities that academicians uh, becoming uh, uh, entrepreneurial? And what is the possibilities and what are the opportunities uh, both in US and India? So just want to say that every country goes through a process. If you were to go back to even the United States and when I was a grad student, and uh, my, I was very fortunate that my advisor was very entrepreneurial. He had a company, and I know that I've done some work for his company when I was a grad student. But he was one of the few, very few, in a university that had a lot of uh, industrial connections. In fact, Drexel University is a city university which uh, leverage a lot on graduate programs in the evening. So a lot of the graduate students are all industry guys who are coming in the evening. Only a few of us were full-time students, grad students. So it was predominantly 60-70% industry guys learning to get graduate programs degrees. Now, in spite of that, my advisor was one of the maybe four or five in the entire university that was entrepreneurial. Now, Going from that, and that I'm talking, say, 1984-85 time thing, going from there to about 2000, a lot of, lot of things changed in the U.S. system in the U.S. Even the National Science Foundation, uh, which is one of the largest funding agencies, which is equal to the Department of Science and Technology here, it changed its way of approach. It started introducing many programs where industry participation became mandated, there is also a significant awakening among the faculty and students that entrepreneurial 
you know, foray is uh, both acceptable and also probably a good option. So the metamorphosis in the 16 years I saw was quite phenomenal. And when I came to India, I must say that I spawned a very similar 1984 India when I joined IIT Madras. In fact, I remember that uh, you have to be uh, very, very careful when you utter the word entrepreneurial within the university system at those times. Today, that is completely changed. Today, the entrepreneurial thinking, entrepreneurs, whether it's a student level, with a research scholar level, or a faculty level, is well accepted. That change in 20 years, which is fairly short for that kind of a, a cultural change, has happened in India. Uh, that uh, is uh, because of many things. Uh, first of all, institutions have changed their approach. Institutions have now adapted, and even now there's an AICTE uh, document that's available. So if any university does not want to go through an internal process, you can adapt the AICTE process for startups within the university system, which definitely allows faculty members to convert some of their research into possible products. But that alone is not enough. You need an ecosystem. You need to promote it. You need to have a cultural change, a mindset change, both among the faculty and among the students, on why, where the research and what are the possibilities of research. India is one of the largest publishers of technical, high quality technical papers in the world. Now, there is no dearth of ideas. There is no dearth of talent in India. Very much testimonial to that is what is going on in other countries where Indians have become more entrepreneurial than the locals themselves. So there is a phenomenal opportunity within India. What we need is a change in the culture, the change in the culture among the students. The students often can drive the faculty. A change in the faculty's mindset. And finally, also a change in the mindset of the administrators. Every university can only immensely benefit from this cultural change. So what I as a faculty have to do is to look at my work and my natural instinct is to go ahead and say, how do I publish it? Which journal do I publish it? I know that this uh, student of mine uh, requires one journal paper so that he can submit his thesis and be accepted. So do I go ahead and yield to the temptation or take a quick look and say, is there something beyond that? Is my student going to go find a job or can I try to convince him or her to look beyond just taking a job in some company or some organization? These are fundamental questions that you have to ask yourself. Now the system, the universe system also has to adapt itself to a point where it has to say, you know, I can't wait for six months for my intellectual property to be filed and wait with my paper and my student uh, waiting for that. This has to change. They, we have to be, you know, reactive to this. This process has to increase, uh, in, you know, it has to really be quick enough for, so that we can allow and encourage faculty and students to patent and publish and also look beyond that. You need ecosystems such as support for students beyond. Uh, so any fine year student or PE student who graduated, should we not allow them to continue on their dream of converting the research into something worthwhile? If so, can we support them for say 12 months, 15 months? These are many small things that the university or the institution can do to foster this cultural change. So there are many things happening in India. I think we are in best of the situations today. We are growing. Startup ecosystem is phenomenal. And I think the universities are going to play a role. And uh, deep tech research is something that uh, I believe has a great future. And I think we probably will talk about that after my talk. So with that, uh, I, uh, if you permit me, uh, I will probably go more towards my uh, work in the next uh, you know, 20 minutes or so. Sure. And I request sir. Please, everybody to thank please. Thank you. And, uh, now you set the context, and I'll come back to you with some questions. I've scribbled some notes. 
I'll come back to you with okay. some questions on what you just said, but please go ahead with the with your main talk. So, so the next uh, 25 minutes or so, I'm going to sort of take you through a journey, a journey all within my, uh, you know, within my employment here at IIT Madras, not before that. And I will be little technical, but try to be broad based enough and I'll try to keep it as simple as possible. Uh, but talk about a very simple technology, which is uh, called as ultrasonic waves. You and I know acoustic waves. Ultrasonic waves is nothing but, and right now we are uh, definitely hearing some acoustic waves, which we would like to, otherwise we can, I think uh, if somebody can please, uh, you know, mute their uh, cell phones, that'll be great. Uh, certainly while I like acoustics a lot, I think uh, we can avoid uh, certain acoustics at this point. So ultrasonic waves, by definition, is something that goes over to 220 kilohertz. I mean, this is what you read in high school. But the acoustic waves by themselves do not know that definition. Okay, they never knew, they never learned that anything over 20 k a kilohertz is uh, ultrasonic waves. So there's no difference between acoustics, which is, I am using to talk to you, and the ultrasonics that I'm going to talk to you a lot about in the near in the next few minutes. I'm going to talk about and applications or applications in the area of what I call asset integrity monitoring. What do I mean by that? So the, what I mean by that is that we live around, and you just look around, you have nothing but engineered products, engineered structures, right from the chair that you're sitting to the microphone that you're speaking through, to the car that you or the scooter that you're going to be using, or the train or the, plane that you're going to be using later by when you travel, although I know that that's been a bit of a, you know, not so much in the recent past, or for that matter, if you live next to a industry like a, a fertilizer industry or a chemical industry or a refinery or a power plant, uh, all of them have assets, assets like pipelines, asset like vessels, they call pressure vessels. These are, uh, and you have things that are cooking inside at very high temperatures, just like a pressure cooker that you use in your kitchen. And everybody who has used a pressure cooker at some point or other knows what happens when the safety valve takes off, right? And uh, thank God you are not next to it when that happens. Or the fact that many of us use cooking cylinders. Only recently you see that the cooking cylinder design has changed. We have, we've been using the same cooking cylinder for 50, 60, 70 years. We have changed that only recently, but you do all understand that the safety, that's a pressure vessel. That's a pre where the cooking gas is pressured at very high pressures. All it needs is for a small crack to be on that cylinder for your safety to be compromised. So all engineering structures actually are very critical, A, in terms of safety, B, also in terms of performance. We need to make sure that they perform very well, efficiently. So when I manufacture something, I want to do it very efficiently. I don't want things to get stopped, something going wrong and me stopping. And that can happen because some of my pipeline may actually start a leak. Some of my pressure vessel may have a problem. So we don't want shutdowns, which are called shutdowns or stop in manufacturing. Cost very expensive. And that expense will actually increase the cost and uh, profit and reduce the profitability. Now, you may ask yourself, why not? Why should? Why do these things happen? These happen because materials, just like human body, actually degrade. So any material over a period of time, like the way your bone and your muscles actually degrade, will also degrade over a short period of time. Now, the question is, what do you do? What do you do with your your own body? You actually go periodically to a doctor. You may get a blood test done. You may even get an ECG done. You may get a doctor to put a stethoscope on you. Pretty much many of these can be similar to what we do in the industry. The idea here is to find something that is going wrong well before it actually goes wrong. So that I can take very proactive steps so that I can prevent anything from affecting me or being a surprise. So that's exactly what we do. We call this a non-destructive evaluation, but exactly similar. And I will see, I have a slide in a minute or two. 
uh, what you already see in the medical field. And we can use our technologies from very early in the design stage of an engineered component, all the way to when an engineered component fails, we can find what went wrong and how to prevent future failures. Now, which means that right from the raw material, how good is the raw material, to how I manufacture it, whether it's primary, secondary, or tertiary manufacturing, to when the product is actually in service, what happens during service? Do I have the ability to be able to inspect? Do exactly what you do to your artery. I mean, here's a guy who's standing on top of a pipeline that's on a valley, probably with a thousand foot drop. He's trying to find out if there's any weak spot in that pipeline that is probably a few kilometers long. No different from your artery and finding some problem with an artery, whether it's clogged or whether there's a, a, a leak in your wall, in your heart, exactly the same thing we do. So that tells you that we have a lot of commonality with medical diagnostics. So whenever you say, I'm doing X-ray imaging, and I think many of you have definitely got done some X-ray on yourself, we call it radiographic testing, So, but identical. If you're talking of a stethoscope, I'm listening to your heart or your lung. We call it an acoustic emission. So we have very similar stethoscope-like sensor that we mount on uh, pipes, we mount on big vessels, and we listen. In fact, I've been involved in work where we can now listen to the bacteria inside a crude oil tank, eat the material or corrode the material by just eating, because that's how it survives. We can hear it eat the material and identify where the corrosion is happening by just listening with many sensors and using simple triangulation, which is the way you normally use to find the source of a sound signal. And we can do that. Similarly, ultrasound, you know, echocardiogram that you normally do, we do the same thing, we call it ultrasound testing and similarly infrared imaging. So there are a lot of, the physics is similar. However, the differences are many. The biggest difference is that the anatomy of a human body has remained the same for centuries or maybe more than centuries, million years probably. That is not the case with engineer components. There are a lot of challenges in engineer components. A few of them are listed here in the next slide, uh, the, wherein we have a lot of different variety of engineering problems. So the anatomy of a human body is not changed a whole lot and are very similar. Your body and my body are not very different. On the same time, you do see, and I, I'm just give me a minute. I don't know why my slide is not uh, moving. Give me a minute. Yeah, there you go. So, uh, so one of the things is that you have large problems like a bridge inspection, all the way to small problems like an electronic component that needs to be inspected. So you the range of problems of many. The type of materials, and every two or three years, new materials uh, come into view. You have new manufacturing process, you have new designs. You have very large volumes. You take a rail inspection, you know, the trains that you ride on. The rails have to be inspected. And we have to find a four, three to four millimeter crack in a rail. And just to let you know that in India, we probably have rails, uh, uh, the total length of railway system is of the order of 200,000 kilometers, of which there are four rails on average. So you're talking of uh, about million kilometers, wherein I'm trying to find a four millimeter crack. So this is much more complicated than a needle in the haystack. How do you do that? All right, now you're gonna add a few more complexities. I'm gonna add accessibility. For instance, if I have to look at this particular bridge, how do I go under the bridge? How do I go into the pile and which is under uh, water? How do I go under that? How do I go on top of these cables? These cables are holding it up. How do I go on top of these cables? These are all critically difficult problems. We may add a few more complexities. High temperatures, 
uh, very bad environments. All that adds to it. And finally, cost. Cost is very critical. So you got to do it also affordably. So that keeps us busy. That keeps me employed. That keeps a lot of us employed. Because if all problems are solved, then we did, nobody needs us. So it's very important that we go forward. And how do we do that? We do that by using everything under our capabilities, like robotics, large scanners, as you can see, handheld instruments, physics, physics of different types, which will come in a minute, robotics. Even we, in COVID times and even before that, we have a method by which we call it a structural health monitoring. But any of you who has had a little patch on your white little patch on your uh, arm measuring a blood sugar on a periodic basis will understand that that gives you a very new paradigm of understanding what is happening with your body whenever you eat a little sweet. And you can even figure out a better way to handle. You eat the same amount of sweet, but in a different way, I still make sure that the sugar level doesn't go above a certain limit. So that is structural health monitoring, where we actually mount these sensors on the structure, keep monitoring the damage mechanisms, and try to manage it so that we can keep prolonging the life. And given COVID situation today, when we are having difficulty in traveling, this is something that is very important. Now, as I said, we use robotics and to handle very harsh environments. So here are some examples where some of our uh, you know, startups, like Planis, I believe is going to be uh, featured later on. Dwani is another industry where we are using robots. So Planis does under the water, Dwani does uh, on the ground, and then Detect, which also could be featured later, is going to do above the ground. And I am not able to, uh, are you able to see the video? I'm not able to exactly see what I'm we see. Uh, the video, video is not playing, but we can see the we can see the three uh, startups. The three uh, the okay, so, that, uh, so 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 I I'm worried about that. Let's see. So the uh, the detects uh, drone based inspection that goes to high, hard to reach areas, and we are able to uh, inspect uh, for that. Now let's see. Um, so yeah, a couple of people have said it. It did play. So maybe it was just. Uh, it did play. Okay, great. Okay, so I couldn't see it, but I'm happy somebody else saw it. So great. So that was the objective. So now, uh, uh, what we are also seeing. So this is our mission. This is our mission: is to use deep research. Some of the physics, underlying physics, we are at path breaking. Uh, we are looking at uh, nano imaging. We are looking at pushing the envelope of imaging. We are looking at pushing the envelope of computing to understand the physics of what's happening better. But our goal is to improve the performance of engineering manufacturing, to be able to improve the safety so that anybody who works inside or who lives nearby is safe, or anybody who's using any of the engineer product is safer. And finally, we also want to create value for the industry by enhancing the life and prolong their life so that there is significant cost saving. And the cost saving is often something that will be translated to the uh, end customer. Now, with me in this journey, I have a very interdisciplinary team that includes Prabhu Kapal from mechanical, Kavita from engineering design, Krishnamurti from physics, Balaji from electrical, Manu from civil, Rama Prabhu from physics, and Tiju from materials. This is a team of us from very dif different disciplines working together because if we don't work together, then we can't solve complex problems. And we are essentially solving the following problems. Can I improve the non-destructive way of imaging and evaluating engineering material structures and products? Can I develop or modify these sensing technology of the physics to where I can continuously monitor the health and the performance of these engineered structures. And finally, can I also make measurements which will help me make the process more efficient and improve performance? These are the three major uh, tasks that we have set ourselves to. And we are using the, both the acoustics as well as the electromagnetic spectrum in doing so. Today, 
what I'm going to be concentrating from now onwards is only one part of that, which is the ultrasound. Now, everybody knows ultrasound to some extent. It's or anything that you measure, uh, have sound waves going above, say, 20 kilohertz. Now, ultrasound is related, its velocity at which it travels related to the elastic properties of a medium, which is the Young's modulus and the shear modulus of the material and the density of the material. So these are three properties. So basically, for measuring velocity, I can get the moduli. If I know the moduli and the density, I can measure, uh, predict the elastic property or the wave properties. Okay. So this is the simple equation that you have to live with. What is interesting is that I can define wave modes differently. I am talking here. You are hearing because your headphones or your speaker is emitting a sound wave that is of the longitudinal mode. That is, the particles are vibrating in the same direction as that of the propagation direction. Now, on the contrary, if I take a string and I shake it, then we will be doing what is called a transverse wave or a shear wave. Now, the velocity of the shear wave is about 50% of that of the transverse wave. Now, these cases, the two directions are perpendicular or parallel to the direction of the wave propagation. Now, you can make it a bit more complicated. You can mix and match them, and then you get what is called a Rayleigh wave or a surface wave. The third cartoon exactly shows that, wherein you see that the surface is moving a lot more. As you go deeper, the motion is very little. So basically, the wave moves only on the surface. It is guided by the surface and very much so. And it has its nice properties. Now, uh, I am definitely having some problem with uh, moving my slides, but that's okay. I'll figure it out. Oh, I know how to do it better. Okay. So now, now what happens is you take the same surface wave and now reduce the thickness of that material and make it very, very small. Then I can also have what are called guided waves. These waves are guided by that plate. And when they travel along the plate, and if there's any corrosion, for instance, or any change in cross section, part of the wave will go through, a part of the wave will reflect and come back, and I can pick it up. Now, what I can do is say that you and I, and anybody who's in this call, have actually used guided waves. You have, as I, uh, I, I'm giving a very simple example here, but you also can have guided waves in plates, in shells, in rods. All I do, you do is you go and knock on your uh, little table, and there's a wave that is gu guided by the table from one end of the table to another end. You can also understand that this wave will follow the curvature. So you can actually have in curved structures in a shell. It will actually follow the shell and go around in a pipe. It can go along the length of the pipe. It can go along the circumference of the pipe. So you have, and you have been using this. Not only you have used it, here's a nice little example where you actually have experienced this in 2004, December, if you are young, uh, old enough, wherein the tsunami wave was actually guided by the Earth's water and the crust. And if you were to believe NASA, this wave actually went around the Earth three times, although it was not strong enough the second time around. So we have been using guided waves almost on a daily basis. Now, when I say guided waves, guided waves are characterized by, as I said, just the way longitudinal and transverse were different. Guided waves are also different, and you can have guided waves in plates. You can have guided waves in uh, rods. Okay, and again, uh, the... Uh, some reason, some things are not working. So you can also have guided waves and rods. I don't know if you are able to see the next part of the slide. Yeah. Okay, so uh, there should be a cylinder. Uh, hmm. so I'm still seeing the, uh, the torsion the only the plate, wave with... Plate, uh, yeah. Oh, you are able to see that. Okay, yeah. I'm not, but are you see, seeing something below that or no? Not, not yet. I, either the shear horizontal and uh, the, that that one is the one I'm dancing. Okay. 
okay, hang on a second. I may be able to change the way. Okay, let's see if this works better. Nope. The, for some reason, my enter button if is you want, not. I can try moving the slide. I, I, I can try moving the slides, Krishna. Just give me one second. Yeah, now I can. I have moved it forward. Uh, okay. It's now showing the calendars. Okay, you're showing. I am unable to see that. That's why. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So now it is showing me your three cylinders, flexural, longitudinal, okay. and torsional. Okay, terrific. So you are able to see the way the three, uh, uh, no, way modes are different. All right. So if you could move yeah. to the next slide, please. Yeah, guided wave advantage. Okay. So there are many advantages to guided waves. One of the main advantages is that you can actually send the wave from a remote location. The wave will follow the contour of the waveguide and we will be able to see it. Uh, very unfortunately, I'm not able to see the slide that you're seeing. Uh, yeah, I think uh, there are others who are also saying they can't see it. So uh, uh, let me yeah, see. So I'll I give can. it back to you. Yeah, okay. uh, now there you, you can, go. Uh, no, yeah, jump. you can give it back to me. Yeah, yeah. okay. Now, go ahead. I, I'm, I think, a little better off right now. Okay, go ahead. So. So the most important part of the guided waves is the fact that just like fiber optics, you know, another example, fiber optics. Fiber optics today has changed the way you communicate. That's exactly what is happening with guided waves and acoustics. In fact, you'll see some similarities a little later. So you can propagate it long distance, makes it much simpler. There are many advantages to this. I won't be able to go through all of the advantages today. And some of the genesis of this starts way back in the 1900. And today, only in the last 30, 40 years, has this been used in the industrial application. And off late, this has been used also in the medical applications, but it's just coming up. For a change, engineering is a little ahead of the med medical applications today. So with that, let me go to my journey. I've been working in guided waves. In fact, I was the first PhD student at Drexel University and probably in most of US in the area of non-destructive testing to use guided waves in their PhD work. So in the early stages, my thesis was in trying to use guided waves to characterize porosity in composite materials, which were also fairly new in those days. Still, we're trying to find a lot of applications in the aerospace industry. Then I moved on and I started working on many applications that included uh, working in uh, stealth based approaches towards guided waves where guided waves could be actually used as a stealth uh, mechanism. Today, it has actually taken off in a very big way where metamaterials are being used for stealth. Again, same principle though, wherein you are using the guided waves to guide it away from where you want it to be uh, showing. Having come to India in 2000, I worked a lot with the, our defense industry particularly again with composites, trying to find mechanisms by which we can do what I call health monitoring. Health monitoring using uh, sensors that we can uh, put on composite structures. And here's an example where we are imaging defects in composites by using a sensor that's put in the middle of a composite structure. We went far further and started actually applying it to real structure. So this is an example of a composite structure that is used in our uh, aircraft, fighter jet aircrafts that is made in India. As I, what you see is in green are the cables coming out. So what we have done is we instrumented that and we are able to monitor the health of this by using waves that are traveling on the structure. A composite structure is very complicated. It's got anisotropy. It has got several features that will, uh, including what I call a stiffeners and ribs and so forth, which will actually complicate wave propagation. So we had to understand the wave, how it propagates in this complicated material, devise an instrument, do what's called the inverse problem to actually back out the data and analyze the data. So this is what we did. A lot of it was for uh, government funded projects. Then around 2009, 10 timeframe, we started seeing more traction. We saw that the ecosystem in IIT Madras was changing. We was becoming more entrepreneurial. I think we'll talk a bit about Research Park later. That became a reality. The incubation 
part of uh, IIT Madras took off around that time. So we started looking at it differently after that. So we started looking at it and say anything that we do is some of it going to turn out to be something that can be valued to the industry or society at large. So that's what kind of where we were. And that, so what I'm going to showcase today are three different uh, uh, journeys. One is a journey on what I call a HOMC. Very interestingly, before 2006, we were actually, more, a lot of people knew guided waves. We were using it for many different things, but most of the guided wave, almost all the guided wave were talked about was in what I call the low frequency regime, which was say below 500 kilohertz. Now, what is interesting is we came up with a problem set. There were a couple of problem sets that came up in the 2006 timeframe, all brought to us from by the industry. One of the critical problem sets that were brought to us from the industry was that whenever you have pipelines, and you know pipelines are plenty in the industry, even I ask you to just go outside, see your own drain pipes. See the thing that's going, find out where is the corrosion. You'll find the corrosion are where something is supporting it. Even the pipes that are coming out of your flats, going into the ground, you'll see that near the ground, there is corrosion happening. And these are where you can't go and just lift it and see what's going on because they're all completely attached. So the question is, how do I find corrosion inside that? We thought that that is difficult to do. However, Interestingly, we found that, and it, and this happens, and many discoveries in the historically have happened by accident. And this is an exact accident that happened. We were looking at guided waves and seeing, can we do that? A lot of the problem that we were facing was that all this corrosion that's happening was affecting the data that is coming back, the information that's coming back. So the question was, can I generate a wave mode that will not be influenced by all the stuff that is happening outside the pipe. And purely by accident, one of my students in accidentally used in a, a transducer or a frequency range, which by mistake, he, re he read it by mistake. He thought it was 0.225. It will actually turned to be 2.25. Okay, this mistake actually learned, uh, and he came back with some results which are startling. In fact, it took me many, many rounds of convincing that it is actually real. And we realize that you can generate these modes not at, only at low frequencies, but also at high frequencies. Okay, sorry, I think we stepped. Uh, I don't know why. Uh, okay, I went a little too far. Okay, let me go back a couple of slides. So, just to make a long story short, that was my aha moment that we have found something that nobody have reported. We, of course, applied for a patent. Uh, we also applied, uh, you know, published a few papers, but we also had very good interactions with both Bharat Petroleum in India and uh, Exxon Mobil outside India. These guys were asking me, how do you solve this problem? So we started working with it. And around 2010, we started a startup and we started standardizing it today. We have over 1,000 uh, uh, customers who are using our 1,000 uh, assets where we are using this. Now, I'm going to show a small video of this a commercial product. Uh, only one of the application. The application is not a pipe support. The application is that of hidden corrosion in a tank. Uh, what you're going to see here, and I hope it will play. Uh, is it? Yeah, there you go. And uh, what you're seeing here is, uh, and I, I, I guess the bandwidth is a bit uh, wanting. What you see here is an asset. I mean, look at the asset here. All those big tanks that you see are, I'm sorry, uh, what happened? No, I think the video uh, the sharing went off. You might have to reshare again. I'll reshare it again. Sorry about that. It's coming back and I will have to quickly move to the, to the lights. Just 
just bear with me for a minute. Let me see where I am. Okay, there you go. Okay. We go back and Okay, I hope that uh, the video comes on. Yeah, there you go. So the storage tanks that you see here, every refinery in the world has close to few hundred of them. And what happens is that there is a significant amount of corrosion that happens. I don't know why this is going on. The video is not playing well. Uh, hold on. We are and seeing you have, the, uh, yeah. the, the GUMPS designed for scale and the, uh, yeah. Uh, okay, I'm hoping that the video is still playing. I can see the software client dashboard now on my screen. Okay, okay. Uh, huh. uh, are you on 22? Slide 22, or you're ahead of the game. I think you. I don't know why, but you are a little ahead of the thing. I'm playing 22 with the video, which is hidden no, corrosion. I think a few slides have gone forward beyond that. I see. I don't know why. You on, I'm uh, designed for refineries. Okay, I tell you what. I don't you're know on why. One slide actually. Yeah. No. I'm on gum slide. I should not be. I should be on. Uh, yeah, now it's. Yeah. Okay, I think it's something to do with. Uh, see, okay. Some reason. I don't know why, why this is happening. Okay. Yeah, this is 25 now on my screen. No, no, I should be 22. So, no idea. Okay, let me go back. I'm, I'm synchronizing to. Uh, see what is we're able to see it on video. Okay, uh, okay, I will skip the video and sync to presentation. Can you go back? I think for some reason, I think between your thing and my thing, we are having a problem. If you can go back to slide number 23 or 24, that'll be good. Uh, okay. I have because now gone seeing... back. I don't know why it's going. Okay. It's on anyway, no, you're 25. Yeah. Okay. And fine. Let, let's, back let, let's move on. Let's move on. Let's move on. So what I want to uh, let, so that was the first journey. Just to make a long story short, we have now more than 1,000 uh, assets that we are monitoring around the globe in 12 countries, and that shows you an example of what is possible. Uh, with with the technology that actually we created by accident. Now I don't know uh, why is my slide moving. My slide is moving without me doing anything. Okay, let me do one thing. Hang on a second. I know what to do. Okay, I'll take control. Yeah, you okay. say take control and come back to. You. Okay, fine. So uh, I'll go back to this slide. Uh, so what is going on? Uh, so what? Uh, just to show you that uh, we now have a very significant. Uh, uh, the company has very significant uh, 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 participation as well as uh, partnership with uh, both companies like Baker Hughes, ExxonMobil, Shell, Bharat Petroleum, Reliance, and many more uh, that I could not put here. But as I said, we are actually monitoring more than 1,000 assets in 12 countries across four continents. So that is the level at which this is this technology has reached. Another example, we, I'll go to the second journey. The second journey is uh, what I call the GUMS journey. Uh, before 2012, the guided ultrasonic waves were very well known and they were used for ins inspection of pipelines and pipelines that are even 
going through culverts, going buried a little bit into the ground. So that was well documented. There are at least two, three, four groups around the world that were working on it. Around 2011-12, we came across industries, particularly in India, particularly Reliance, which came to us and said, see, most of our pipelines are operating at high temperatures, typically 100 to 300 degrees Celsius. And none of these technologies, the only way I can do an inspection on these pipelines, the pipelines are, a very, are the lifeline. They are like your arteries and veins that run through your body. So very important. And the only way that we can inspect them and keep them, uh, have confidence is by shutting it down, bringing the, everything to room temperature, and then only I can use these technologies. This is becoming a huge uh, performance issue because every time I shut down my plant, I lose a lot of money, also time. So can you figure a way to do it at high temperatures? Honestly, those days we were not sure. That is when again, we got an aha moment. The aha moment that time was that one of my students and I, uh, uh, Tarun Mishra, from, who is now part of Detect Technologies, and I figured out that there are materials that can actually generate sound waves and receive sound waves and operate up to 350 degrees Celsius on a continuous basis. In fact, he showed that over several months, the sensor was not degrading. So that meant that there is a possibility that we can solve this problem. But from there to actually solving the problem takes a lot of effort. So thanks to Reliance, over two to three years of hard work, we actually qualified this. Uh, you can see Tarun Mishra there on the top, along with uh, uh, one of our rudimentary electronics uh, and everything else, towards where we actually installed a system, which is the figure on the third, or the last one here, showing, and then uh, we were actually able to demonstrate that to Reliance. And that's kind of when it became apparent to us in 2016 that this is a commercially viable product. So we have gone from there to a very significantly advanced stage. So for instance, the way we do it today is that a long section of pipeline has sensors on every on either side of the bend, an ultrasonic wave goes through that. All the data is captured and then taken to a cloud platform. And where are we today? Today, we have international certification up to 120 degrees C with 200 degrees C almost also obtained. So very soon we'll be able to operate at 200 degrees C in, in very, uh, what they call a zone one explosion, uh, uh, you know, hydrocarbon environment. In the future is that we'll try to push it to 300 degrees C. It is able to capture defects at 1% sensitivity and one sensor can monitor 60 meters of pipeline, which means that you, and then this is continuous monitoring. So even in COVID times, you don't have to worry about it because the data will come to you in, uh, in, a, uh, in your dashboard. So, uh, so we have of course created the dashboard which will monitor all these sensors over a period of time. So every month you'll see which one went a little bit over the limit of corrosion, which one did not. So here's an example where something went a little bit over in June for a particular client. Immediately, they, we can go and find out which sensor, what went and try to go to that particular one and see, can we repair it before it creates problems for us? So that kind of gives you an idea of the, not only the, the type of problem that we can solve with a simple technology like a guided wave, but also its value proposition to the end client and also to what level we have to do it. We have to do the everything. We have to do the certification. We have to do the technology, the electronics, and the final information processing. And this has now led to uh, a company that has about 120 plus uh, with 100 enterprises as clients in U you know, in Middle East, US, Singapore, and India. And I believe that this company will, of course, make a special presentation to you shortly. Now, the last, the third journey is something I call a port journey. Port stands for portable rheology and temperature sensor. So we're going from inspection now to sensing, but must understand that these are not totally unrelated because they all contribute to information of what your process is happening. And that leads to improved life 
and improved performance and improved safety. We are always going after these three goals. So again, what was the uh, knowledge before 2014? I've been working in this particular area of waveguide sensing since 1994. So we knew a lot about what the physics was. However, we were measuring temperature separately. We were measuring rheology separately. Industry came to me and said, hey, this is done by others also. There are laboratories instruments. Can you do something better? Can you go ahead and mix them together and give me one sensor that will do both and it should work in the process itself? And the aha moment came when we were able to design the waveguide with a couple of my PhD students, prove that it can work across a wide range of temperatures and rheology. And today we have a commercial product and the commercial product is, uh, you know, something which uh, Zyma, a company of ours is uh, uh, marketing it. Uh, I don't know if that video that you see here, you can see it. I hope you can see it. Okay, there you go. I'm playing this video here. Uh, what we are doing here is that we have a, a waveguide and surrounded by fluid. By measuring certain parameters of the wave that's traveling inside the waveguide, we can definitely measure what is surrounding the fluid. So that's exactly what we are doing. So here's an example, the same the temperature is in blue. The red indicates the rheology or the viscosity of the fluid. We are heating the fluid, that's where temperature is increasing. And as expected, the viscosity is decreasing. And you can see these, both of them are measured by my sensor at the same location, by the same electronics and by the same ultrasonic physics. And that is the beauty. Today, people actually take samples out and go and measure it in the laboratory. And sometimes the time it takes to do that is very long. And what we have also now in the process of doing is an ability to actually productize it completely. On the left-hand side, you see the actual waveguide with the electronics associated with it. And if the client wants a little portable instrument to monitor it wirelessly or wired, on the right-hand side, you see that we have actually got instrument that is working well. This technology, for instance, is uh, supported by a lot of IP, uh, about, uh, about more than a dozen IP have been filed, more than 35 journal papers have been published, several theses. So this shows you how deep and how long it takes for you to develop technologies. But the key thing is now we are able to productize it. And we have significant amount of interest from many industries. I'm hoping that a few of my uh, colleagues from these industries are listening to me today. Uh, but we are very excited. And I know that many of my uh, our partners here are equally excited about the possibilities. So with that, I'm coming to the summary of my talk, saying that my journey from in India from 2000, when I on February 1, I landed in, at 2 a.m. In, uh, in Chennai to today, it's been incredibly exciting. IIT has provided a platform that is second to none. We have managed to not only create a great research group, lots of great students, a lot of researchers, wonderful publications, a lot of recognition, but more importantly, we are also able to contribute to the well-being of the country and well-being of the industries worldwide with the effort to increase performance of the industries, with the effort to improve safety for the people who work in and around it, and finally, to prolong the life to make a sustainable world. Through this partnership with our startups, right from Dwani Research in 2010 to Azeriri, which is one of the recent startups, we have more than 10 startups emerging from our lab, I'm sorry, with 500 employee, more than 500 people employed, valuations of the excess of 100 million. And of course, lots and lots of intellectual property filed by these companies in addition to what we do in IIT Madras itself. And uh, we are very happy that we have global partners in many parts of the world. Over the next few years, we hope to expand that even further. And finally, I want to say that we believe that we in IIT Madras have created an ecosystem that is 
world class. We, our work is uh, acknowledged, accepted, and recognized by uh, many, many countries and people uh, work for both academia and from uh, industry. And the most important thing is we are creating a portfolio of lab to market transition companies, startups. And that is probably uh, something that uh, keeps me uh, busy and also keeps me extremely, extremely happy and interested. Thank you. Be happy to answer questions. Thank you, sir. I think, uh, you know, if, if this had been a live audience, we would have all stood up and given you a standing ovation, so to speak, but I can see a lot of virtual claps coming through. Uh, there are several questions coming up on the chat, but before I, I go there and, and I encourage all uh, listeners to uh, to please put the questions in the chat or raise your hand, a uh, virtual hand, and I will come to you. I already see Dr. Radhakrishnan's question and he's also raised his hand, raised his hand. Up as well. But I just uh, give me a couple of uh, you know, uh, questions that I can you know lead with uh, uh, my thoughts after hearing this uh, phenomenal uh, you know work, sir, that you have done. Um, the uh, you know going back to my original thesis that based on your uh, success story that in 20 years you have not just done great research world class research but you have also uh, you know commercialized it extremely well uh, two thoughts come to mind uh, one is that as a country how should we fund basic research itself um, you know, uh, I, I am the CTO of TCS and I do uh, a, a fair bit of uh, research, but usually I don't get into basic research. Most of it is applied. I'm sure that is true for many other industries as well. Uh, so should India have the equivalent of what the US has, for example, like the NSF? Uh, uh, you know, there is a national research fund which has been uh, announced in India with very ambitious plan. And there are, of course, sectoral funds available in India through DST, DBT, DRDO, ISRO, etc. Uh, and as I said, industry also does some industry-funded research. You've been uh, active in uh, ICNSR in, in IIT Madras as well. So what is your view, sir? How should research in India be fund, uh, uh, funded overall? Uh, I think uh, um, I, I'm sure you are aware of this. Um, but that there is an ambitious, um, you know, uh, there are ambitious vision documents that are available. I've been a part of a couple of them. Uh, just, uh, uh, and, and you probably know this statistic, but just to put it on record, that India today, and this is uh, all R&D put together, uh, does about 0.6% of its GDP. This is, uh, I mean, a couple of years ago data. And I know there have been vision documents that wants to, and uh, in comparison, uh, China is like 2.5 or so, and then US is close to four. Okay, so that kind of gives you, and mind you, the uh, in absolute number, that is even, the, the disparity is even more significant. So this is something that I'm not the first one to say this. I think everybody knows this. But I also must say that the Indian government and its policy, vision policies in the next 10 to 15 years, are very clear that we want to move towards a 4%. Okay, so I was a part of the vision uh, 2035, uh, where the SAC PM uh, you know, uh, was a chairman, and uh, we are looking at a 4% over the next, by 2035. And given the fact that the GDP will also probably double by that time or triple or whatever, if it's 5 trillion or more, then I think we'll have significant money coming. So I don't think money, in itself is the issue. It is our change in the way we do research. Even fundamental research today, I think we need to re reduce the bureaucracy in research. We have to understand that research needs special rules of engagement. Unfortunately, any money that's come from the government is whether it is for laying a road or doing the most advanced scientific research is all on the same set of rules. I think that is one area where we need to address so that researchers are not the best suited for handling 
uh, I, I, auditors and accountants. Okay. <laughs> And, and that is where the conflict is very severe. That's the first problem. Second problem that I would like to address is that there should be a timeline associated with many of the processes. Uh, uh, that is uh, sometimes you get very uh, interesting and very quick decision making. And there are others when the decision making is extremely slow. I think research cannot wait for it. They, well, on, on the positive side, Indian government is doing a lot of innovative things with the imprint program and the UAY program. A lot of industrial participation was encouraged and mandated, and that really created a lot of interaction between academia and industry. I think that was a step in the right direction. I think this needs to be one of the key ways by which we should go forward. The other thing was the new approach. For the first time, DSC is setting up Section 8 companies within the university systems, which is a shift in paradigm, wherein uh, through the, its uh, uh, cyber physical systems program, I think this yeah. is a great, 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 uh, you know, um, uh, it's a game changer in my mind. I just hope that that translates just not as a one-off, but it translates into philosophical uh, change in the way the government looks at research and government uh, looks at how government wants to drive research into products, into startups, into something that has an impact to the community. So, so very that, valid that's Yeah, I think you make a valid point that government certainly has a role, but as the GDP grows, uh, all participants have to, uh, you know, lift the, the entire thing and money is is really you know getting to be uh, uh, much more available for research and uh, both fundamental as well as uh, applied and large amounts are being set aside for national missions the cyber physical mission that you had indicated sir yes uh, you know uh, i happen to be on the board of that and it was a leap of faith that we can get good support from the government Red. that uh, setting up separate companies and funding the you than the, uh, we, we are having an interesting question coming up <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> right. So, uh, you know, the, the, the lesson is that, uh, per, you know, good research and uh, uh, research which is impactful is not just going to get government support, but you've had uh, a lot of you know, industry anchors. You know, you mentioned the oil and gas industry, Bharat Petroleum, Indian Oil, Reliance. Uh, and then I saw many of the big name international companies, Exxon, uh, Baker Hughes, uh, Tata Steel in the materials industry and so on. So I think uh, there is a critical mass, and after that, it starts rolling. So, with that, let me, uh, you know, I had one other question, but I'll come back to it. There are several others who have raised their hands. So, Dr. Radha Krishnan, sir, can you go ahead with your question? You'd also put it in the chat, but uh, please go ahead. Unmute yourself and ask the question. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Radha Krishnan? Krishnan Balasabramanam, good evening. Sir, good evening. How are you? Very happy to see you. Same Very excellent, uh, excellent talk. I learned a lot from your talk today. I see a large applications, and this can find a great scope in healthcare, as you have mentioned. Yes. So I wanted to know for a patient who is in ICU with a heart wall malfunction, can you continuously uh, monitor the progression of the disease? online and give it to the doctor over a period of time? Uh, the, the answer is uh, most probably yes, because uh, interestingly, quite coincidentally, my one of my students who did a master's with me went on to US and worked with uh, uh, co co some colleagues of mine in Michigan State, and they were exactly doing that. So they use, uh, they, so very similar to MRI. So, you, so what they did was they created a magnetic field and watch the vibrational pattern. The idea here is that by you measuring the vibrational modes of that valve, they were able to tell the integrity of that valve and performance of the valve. There is some work, uh, some of it is published, some of it is not published because of uh, because they were supported by a big valve company, uh, heart valve company. But uh, so the idea is, so there is some uh, existing work wherein we are using electromagnetic NDE methods to actually, without, in a, even uh, touching the patient, we are able to monitor the valves. So biomedical 
applications of NDE is a very significant uh, uh, opportunity. Whether it is before you, the implants, um, uh, during the manufacturing of the implants, uh, but also more importantly, you know, health monitoring of those implants uh, during the uh, actual you know, uh, implementation and post-implementation. So I believe there is a huge market for it. Sir. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Krishnan. God bless you. It's Thank a you. very challenging area in medical field. So Thank I you, wish to continue in this area also. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, I see Shankar Raman uh, with your hand up, sir. Can you unmute yourself and ask a your question? Yeah, Shankar happens uh, to be my thanks. colleague from Drexel, so uh, PhD times. Now Good professor evening. in IT Trichy. Yeah. Am Shankar, I audible? Uh, yeah, you are. Okay. What has been the level of success in real-time measurement of temperature and viscosity of liquid? Uh, liquid slags and subsystems. Yeah, so uh, right now our focus is on Newtonian fluids right now, uh, which is a very large uh, opportunity by itself. So I think I showed you a small video, right? Uh, showing that we are able to do that. Okay, so as long as the fluid is uh, can be assumed to be uh, Newtonian, uh, we have a tool right now ready-made available. In fact, uh, I said it's in commercial mode. So my uh, com the company Zyma can come and uh, evaluate it very almost uh, uh, tomorrow if necessary. So we have it ready. But the thing is that it's got to be assumed to be uh, the assumption we are making is a Newtonian fluid. Non-Newtonian fluid we are working on it. It'll take some time. Now the other thing is our range of temperature may be limited to about. 1400 degrees Celsius. So we said slag. So that tells me that worries me a little bit. But up to 1400 degrees C, we have, and we are working with uh, melt, uh, uh, metals companies. I won't, don't want to say who and all we are working with. We are looking at measuring temperature and uh, we are trying to look at even rheology of these melts, metal melts. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, sir. Stay safe. Uh, VN, VN Krishnan, you've got your hand up, sir. Please go ahead, uh, unmute yourself and ask your question. Sir, in the oil and gas industry, there are hundreds of kilometers of pipelines. This technology, can it be used for leak detection? Uh, not uh, yes and no. Uh, see, leak detection is often considered a bit uh, late stage uh, information by many people. However, uh, we do have another startup and another technology that might do the trick for it. Uh, we can do with this, but this is not the best way to approach very, uh, so there are two types of pipes, sir. One is within what they call the battery limit, and then they have the long distance, that is uh, going from city to city and so forth, okay? So- yeah, I'm talking about the long distance. I suspected that. So now for that, uh, the most common way is by what's called a pigging. So only way you can, and many of them are uh, not accessible because they're buried. Most of them buried or, you know, uh, very difficult to access. Very few of them are above the ground. So what happens is that uh, access is a big problem. So pigging is the only uh, well-known way. Now we are trying to make pigging a little bit uh, affordable and little, a little different. So we do have sensors which are in, uh, we are working with the Indian Oil Corporation to develop this sensor, which will be like tiny balls tennis ball like things which you can put into into your product line and collect it say you know 100 kilometer 200 kilometer down the road and mm -hmm. it will tell you uh, give you a uh, mapping of what is what is the situation a bit in, when while you travel and uh, from that you can infer where there could be leaks we are actually doing this today with uh, in a more conservative fashion uh, for water leaks Today, that's, that's a company called Solisa, Solinas Integrity. In fact, only yesterday we finished something in Chengalpet. So we are looking at water pipelines, and there is a huge problem there also. Thank you, sir. Because today, the there are leak detection systems available, but most of them are the results are not satisfactory. Yeah. The exact point of leakage it, it varies 
the, the tolerance level is more than 10 kilometers so it is very difficult to identify it is sir, to... I, I suspect you are talking about the fiber optic cables is that what you are talking about sir no today the the technology is on uh, differential pressure measurement Okay, differential pressure measurement. Yeah, that 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 that's that's much more difficult. That's, no, that's, we can we can do better, but but mind you, we have to put something in the fluid and let the uh, ball go all the way through. Let the wave see what happens to that. Yeah. So typically, we uh, I, the the range is about a couple of meters, two to three four meters is the oh, sort of the sensitivity. Can't you get you? Right. Uh, yeah. Uh, so our product is under development, but there is a commercial uh, vendor from Canada who is uh, uh, offering similar services. We are trying to make it, we are overcoming some of the drawbacks of that. But uh, I think the commercial vendor does have a reasonable, sensitivity wise, he's okay. I think there is some issue with branching and, and balls getting lost. So oh. that is where the issue is. Okay. So we are trying to make sure that we will find the balls when they get lost. Thank you. Thanks. In fact, the uh, you know the water industry. I mean, the your water utilities, especially in uh, the UK and Europe. Uh, and there's an Israeli company which does a lot of this passive detection of water utility pipe leakage. But active detection, I think, is still a little too expensive for that industry because you know for them it's even the water leakage is not a good thing. But uh, they just ignore it. But it'll be interesting. So anyway, going back to questions, uh, Sudanshu, uh, you have your hand up. Please go ahead. Uh, uh, right, just uh, just before you know, I just want to uh, uh, do a rebuttal on uh, what Anand said. Tamil Nadu loses just this one share of Tamil Nadu loses 172 crores worth of water every day. This is more yeah. no, the in the other water. parts of the world, yeah. uh, other part of the country, and it is. And I've done the uh, digging. It is true even in the US. Okay, the numbers are a little better in the US, but still the value is the same. Yeah. It's no, I agree. The, 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 they, call it, they call it non revenue water. So, yes. NRW minimization NRW is, is, is on the balance sheet for this Yeah, so I'm just saying that I, I didn't I didn't dispute the the extent. I'm just saying that they don't know what to do, so they ignore it. Right, right. <laughs> so, I mean, so it makes it worthwhile. To actually invest money into that, to be honest with you. Very true, very true. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, sir. go ahead. So Sorry, Dr. Spanish, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Uh, good evening, doctor. Very nice talk. I am having the experience of life estimation and refining, refinery assets. I do have sir, that experience. Uh, yes, my point is that uh, the, the sensors which picks up the corrosion happening inside the asset, for example, pressure vessels or pipelines. What is the uh, measurement? Uh, what is, does it get corrosion rate in MPY mils per year, or some some other way it is interpreted? This so is uh, yeah, the answer to that is absolutely. We do. We give you uh, as a uh, rate of uh, uh, what do you call a loss of what do you call a yeah. cross sectional wall loss. Yeah, as a exactly. function of time, we give you. So I just want to know: Is there any? You know, it is all software. The output is comes through some software. Do you have any inbuilt that uh, that it can give, say, life estimation if I give the input data, the uh, current uh, uh, thickness of the pipe or the vessels? Do you uh, have that inbuilt in? Because there are certain API methods, API uh, published uh, codes, like 579, they call it FFS, fitness right. purpose. Uh, purpose. Hmm. Right. So they have a certain methodology which you can inbuilt so that the end user gets a life estimation as on today. Suppose if I get the so data, that, right, right, sir. Yes. Sir, we do. We do have uh, a very sophisticated dashboard that we provide to the end user. Okay, wherein we can program into that any standards, API standards or ISO standards, depending on what they want to use. We can program that into the pro, into that code. Okay, so so that is already done. In fact, our uh, systems are today in at least. Four refineries in India and a couple, few refineries uh, outside India, continuously monitoring the health of certain critical sections of pipelines. Now, I, but each one of these may not have the same standards that they follow. Depending yes. on the client, we we change the standards. 
depending on the criticality of the pipe, also the numbers change. So you know that very well. Depending on the schedule, depending on the uh, uh, where what is inside, what is the product inside, what temperature operating, all that matters. So, so, so we do have the possibility to enter those values. Thank you, sir. Just last question. Uh, there is a uh, you know corrosion phenomena. We call it HTH, a high temperature hydrogen atom, which propagates in very very minuscule. So very high, uh, high end uh, you know, ultrasonic methods are used. Do you have a sensor for that HTH, we call it high temperature hydrogen atom. Do you have a sensor? So so what happens is like anything. Now if you go to the sky and look down, you can see the big picture. Okay, so that's kind of what we are doing with the guided waves. That is, we are trying to give you the bird's eye view. Now, for the HIC that you are talking about, you need to go a little bit deeper. So for that, uh, today there are, as you know, very well, very good ultrasonic techniques. Well, nowadays, I think they're using phase arrays mostly. But unfortunately, you can't have a global picture, so you got to go to that region and uh, be able to do the inspection. There is very little that we can do from a global uh, perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, sir. So I will, uh, you know, have to uh, play the villain a little bit because we are now only eight minutes away from closing the talk. But uh, I had uh, my apologies to Anand, Balagopal, Prakash, and Amir. Uh, if you can send us the questions uh, to the alumni center, we will forward them to professor and uh, get them answered offline, sir, with your permission. Uh, I had one concluding question to ask on behalf of the alumni center that in this journey, uh, you know, what role do you foresee uh, alumni and alumni center uh, uh, playing in, in uh, helping this uh, overall uh, overall journey, not just the work that you're doing, but the broader picture that you had outlined? Some right. thoughts from you, sir. So, uh, so uh, I know alumni for every institution is certainly the window to the world. And it's more true for IIT Madras than most others. Uh, our alumni association has been extremely active. And one of the best things that they do is to connect us uh, with uh, people who may, so, the, so, the, so can we have this problem to solution connection fit? Uh, you know, which alumni can definitely play a big role in. Many of our alumni are in very important positions or have been in very important positions. They understand the industry very well. What we would ask of them is more than a, the money, which of course is welcome, is the time. The time, if we can have, uh, uh, you know, some time for mentoring young faculty, I would very much like every one of the uh, young faculty to have at least one, if not two, alumni mentor. Wherein I would like them to come and spend at least online, whatever format that is convenient, at least once in three months, do a review, find out and give us, give us, uh, make sure that we get, see, because the future of all IITs rests with our young faculty and the students and the country also depends a lot on the future PhDs and master's students who are going to come out of our institution. How do we skill them? Not just with technological uh, expertise or scientific expertise. How do we skill them better? With soft skills. How do we skill them with an entrepreneurial culture? How do we skill them with a problem statement and driving towards a solution of a problem, or even looking at a problem they are solving, which may not have a fit, but then how do we try to find that fit? And I know that almost every one of the problems being solved in our laboratories in IIT Madras has some application somewhere. And this is kind of where I would like to uh, explore with alumni, how do we do that? How do we do that efficiently? I understand that, uh, you know, we can talk a lot about million ways to do it, but I think the trick to the, uh, the whole thing will be how do we do it efficiently and have a methodology by which we monitor the progress and the efficacy of what we are trying to do. I think, uh, you know, instead of saying 
uh, you know, I, I, uh, grind, grind, having a grand uh, wish list, I think it's important that we start. And one easy way would be, as I said, to have a mentor process for every young faculty who wants one. And I think that'll make, will make a big difference because they are the future of the institute. Excellent suggestion, sir. In fact, with the alumni center now uh, coming up and, and physically open now at the research park, the physical distance is also uh, not an issue. So literally you can uh, drive up the uh, the institute uh, bridge into the uh, into the car park of the research <laughs> park and we are on the, on the 10th floor of the C block. So we really look forward to that, you know, pandemic, uh, you know, once it eases, I think this kind of interaction that you said, mentoring the faculty is, is equally there. We are mentoring startups, uh, you know, and, and we will see some of your startups in later uh, sessions in this uh, series itself, but I think the alumni center now has its task cut out, and you've really, uh, you know, laid out uh, a good, good vision for it. And if I may say, the the same philosophy of alumni centers coming up in the research parks is now being replicated. You know, Bangalore and Chennai are already active uh, in uh, in the IIT alumni research uh, uh, IIT alumni centers, and Karakpur, Delhi, and Bombay are also going to get their uh, their alumni centers shortly inside the research parks. So I think this this movement will grow and this connect between faculty, students, uh, the startups, the research park and alumni will get strengthened with uh, more and more centers like this coming up. So once again, sir, my personal thanks. If we had this as a as a, a, a real talk, we would have followed this up with a fantastic dinner. Uh, but my apologies that you know, the virtual format does not allow us to that. But okay. the dinner is on us. And when we do open up, we will be very happy to host you. Uh, there. So uh, with that, I'll close the session, but I will not before informing all the uh, attendees that please do tune in next weekend for our second uh, session, which will be hosted by. Uh, it's a it's a session uh, with uh, uh, a very different topic here. We had uh, Professor Krishnan talk to us about a very, very phenomenal journey in uh, technology. Our next topic is in the Popuri session, the mixed bag session. So it is uh, Vijay Kamalakara. CEO of Story, which run, uh, uh, you know, uh, walks around uh, uh, Chennai city, and he'll talk about unexpected tales behind Indian monuments. Uh, and so do tune into that same time uh, uh, next Saturday. And later on, as I said, we're going to have weekly sessions. There will be one hosted by Gopal with Planis, which is one of the companies that the Professor Krishnan mentioned. Uh, we also have in August uh, sessions coming up uh, on iTunes hosted by Sabesh. Uh, there will be a session uh, which uh, will be on the famous uh, Sutra model of uh, COVID-19 prediction uh, by none other than Professor Manindra Agarwal of IIT Kanpur, and I'll be hosting that session on the 14th of August. Okay. Uh, we'll also have a joint session with the IIT Madras alumni featuring Professor Bhaskar Murthy on 15th. And our first quiz is scheduled to be on the 21st, uh, hosted by Meenakshi Ramesh. So exciting uh, sessions coming up every week. Uh, so do tune in. Thank you again for joining today. And thank you again, uh, Professor Krishna. Thank you so much. It's a great pleasure. Good night all. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very thank much. Thank you. Thank you okay. to all. Stay safe. Thank you. We had over 100 attendees today, by the way. Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Thanks very thank much. Thank you very much, sir. Bye-bye. Nice. Take care. Take care. Thank all. you. Thank you very much, sir. All. Thank you, Yadav. Thanks. Thanks so much. Good to know you. Very, very motivating talk. Very nice. Thank you, Shankar. Thank you all. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Stay safe. Uh, Krishan. Uh, it was a very nice lecture, yeah. sir. Thanks, sir. Thank you, Vinny. Thank you, sir.